Good morning to you from St. Michael's Church and this is a little hamlet called Rushmere and about a mile from where I live you might be able to see the, the round tower of the Saxon church there and um, it's a beautiful still morning you might hear the clip clopping of the horses coming there I don't know if you can see them that's just one horse there we go um, I'm not sure if I angled the camera correctly one lady rider going there, enjoying the freedom of the countryside. And uh, the word freedom came to mind this morning. And uh, I'd like to share a few thoughts about that with you when I get back to the car. Yes, what does it mean to be free? I went to visit my, uh, my dear brother in Christ, Paul. Uh, those of you that have gone on to my community tab would have seen that I put out a prayer request for him. Uh, he suffered uh, a severe stroke and he's now in, uh, in the stroke ward of the hospital. And I went there yesterday and um, it was quite upsetting to see because he's lying there. He can't really speak. He can't eat. He can't swallow. And um, he sleeps probably nearly 24 hours of the time now. He's got special shin pads on his legs to keep his blood pressure stable. And uh, I don't know all the medical uh, things that are connected to him, but um, he's lying there. And I suppose the first thought that comes to mind, isn't it, as human beings, is, well, he's no longer free. He's bound to a bed, bound to the disease or the thing that is holding him down so that he can't move. And the call for freedom is something that aches in the human heart, isn't it? Sometimes we um, mistake the word freedom for something else, which I'll talk about in a second, but um, the cry of the heart is for freedom. Think of the French Revolution. I don't know all the words. Uh, is it liberty, fraternity, egalitarian, egalitaire, or something like that? Those of you that are historians will correct me there. But that desire for freedom as soon as they were told, let them eat cake, it just wasn't good enough for them. And of course, across the world we're seeing it, aren't we? People are rising up, places like Sri Lanka, different parts of the world. Of course, over the last two years, we've been doing it here too. Protest marches through the cities, wanting to gain what we've had before. And um, freedom is often substituted with another word. That word is convenience, and um, people are told it's going to be more convenient if you do this or you do that. And of course, technology is making things more and more convenient. And um, we're told you don't need to carry a plastic card. You're going to have freedom from a plastic card. You can have the chip inside your body. Um, way back to the 1950s, there was no need to wash clothes. The inventions of the washing machine. Now it's no need, you, you don't need paper, do you, anymore? Um, your bank contacts you and says, don't you um, prefer to have just an email or a text telling you what your balance is as opposed to a paper bill? So we're freed from irksome tasks as well. The word freedom just comes into everything, doesn't it? And um, the truth is, what kind of a freedom are we being sold? The word itself is quite interesting because... Uh, if you look it up in Strong's Concordance, um, it only actually occurs once in the New Testament, and that's in Acts chapter 22, verse 28. And uh, here, um, Paul is talking here about his Roman citizenship. And uh, he goes, and when I would have known, sorry, that's, Acts, that's 23, sorry, back to 22. Twenty-two, twenty-eight, And the chief captain answered. This is when Paul was pleading his cause as a Roman. And the chief captain answered, With great sum I obtained this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. It's interesting, isn't it? That political freedom meant everything in those days. And to be a Roman citizen, that really meant something. Today it's a bit like being a British citizen. It was regarded as the gold standard. Politikos, I believe, is the word. If you look it up, politics comes from that word as well. To be free, to move in the affairs of the cities, 
to be able to have a voice. We talk about democracy today, don't we? And of course, slavery is the very opposite of democracy. And um, we all cry for that in the heart. But what are we being sold today? I believe what we're being sold, and for those of us that are Christians and have our heads screwed on straight, we're being sold slavery, not freedom. Yes, Revelation 13 is clear. You'll have a mark on your right hand or forehead. But of course, most people, if you talk to them today in the world, they'll say, but that's fantastic. I don't have to worry anymore about um, losing anything, like my bank cards or my money or anything like that. And so people have sold something that is the complete opposite to what they actually really need. And I thought about um, what it really means to be free, to have that liberty in Christ. And uh, three scriptures came to mind. And uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 22. Paul is saying here, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Now, there's a mixture there of the word, isn't there? You're a freeman in the citizenship of the sense, you know, in the sense of the world, but you are now actually the Lord's servant. So your freedom is now bound up when you're in Christ. But it's bound up to more freedom, which is, is, is the uh, irony of this. And likewise, Paul says, he that is called at being free is now Christ's servant. So you're a servant, but you're free. If you were free, you're a servant. But in the kingdom of God, being a servant is, is the freest thing you can be. That sounds a little bit convoluted and jumbled. I hope I've got the point across there. My friend is lying in, in um, hospital, but he's in Christ. His body is bound down, but his spirit isn't. His mind isn't. And he's holding on to that freedom in Christ, which is what God wants us to do. Whether we're in bed, whether we're in... Um, any kind of uh, suffering or depression or anything that binds us up. God wants us to be free and to be walking in him, no matter what state we're in in the world. Peter clarifies it for us here in 2 Peter 2 verse 19. While they promise live them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. And this is what they want for you. This is what Satan wants for you. He wants you to be overcome with the idea that all these conveniences are great things, but they'll bring you more and more into bondage. We're seeing, aren't we, the political systems of the world collapsing. But yet there's more and more of a call for freedom. But it's corruption that's behind it. Because it's only the elites in their minds that are going to have their true freedom. And the rest of us are going to be their slaves. It's a convoluted message this morning, but I want to just get the point across. Liberty from slavery is what Jesus has called us to. He's called us to, to walk in the Spirit, to walk in his power, to walk in his trust, and to know that what he's promised us is something wonderful. The very first words that came out of Jesus' mouth to me are the most beautiful words of all. When he stood up to, to begin his public ministry and he said these words in, in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. This is what it's about. This is the message. Jesus is talking about true liberty. So no matter what state we're in, whether it's a hospital bed or a prison cell, or you're bound to a job that you don't like, or you're, you're bound to a family situation that you would wish you could get out of, you have that liberty in Christ now. You already have that freedom. 
the opening of the prison to them that are bound, Jesus says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. That's the true freedom and the freedom of the millennial kingdom. This is what we're going to be seeing and experiencing. It's not going to be long away. Let's not quibble about the when, but we know that it's going to happen. We know soon. I honestly believe, and it really struck me yesterday over the last, that the last two years have really, really brought us to a new place. And that freedom has come closer and closer to us. So hold tight, hold on and know your freedom's already been won for you at the cross. It's for freedom that Christ died. As Paul says in Galatians, we're not bound to a law or the laws of man, or certainly not Old Testament law. We have a Sabbath rest in Christ, and it's, it's permanent and it's eternal. And there are things yet to happen that are too wonderful for us to understand. But to be inside the Lord is true freedom, to be, in, to be held in his arms, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And under that Almighty shadow is true freedom. So I pray today that your worship is worshipping time wherever you go, or if you don't go anywhere, that it's a time that you uh, think about the Lord and the joys and the pleasures that he's brought to you and will bring you. And let's live in that hope and in the knowledge that that glorious freedom is coming. Have a blessed day.